Well, as you know, and thanks for coming back for a second helping, there'll be seven helpings of this smorgasbord. It's seven crises when the Catholic Church died, almost. And as Rudy uh, and I were uh, talking about just before the class began, there's, you know, the, the church is always, always in a battle. Uh, St. John describes it a little bit in the Apocalypse, I mentioned this last week, that uh, he sees a vision of a woman clothed with the sun, uh, trying to give birth to the child who will rule all the nations. And once she gives birth, the dragon comes up and wants to gobble the child up immediately. So, uh, and that goes on, that struggle goes on, uh, you know, throughout the entire history of the church. Today, we're going to look at something that is really almost impossible to believe, but it happened. Uh, we're going to see some really sad events that took place and also some amazing moments of heroism. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, it, it, they, literally we use the term awesome quite a bit, but, uh, you know, one person in particular that we're going to talk about today was absolutely nothing short of awesome. And he raises a lot of, not only an example for us, but a lot of questions. Where we begin is with the, uh, the victory, or where we left off last time, the victory of Constantine as emperor of Rome after uh, close to 240 years of, of, of persecution, of being an illicit religion. Christianity is now the favored religion of the emperor. And all of a sudden, the chessboard has changed. We've got a whole new game I mean, going on here. And I'm going to show you a little film clip in a second, but I want to explain to you a little bit what you're going to see. What you're going to see is the victorious march of the Allied Army, actually the British Army, into the occupied town of Assisi, okay, liberating Assisi during World War II. And uh, I want you to pay particular attention to uh, a man with a white hat who comes up in the, in, the, in the movie. This man with the white hat is the chief of police, okay, of Assisi. He had been a fascist and Nazi collaborator. Throughout the entire uh, uh, previous years under the Nazi occupation, he had been working hand in glove with the Germans to try especially to capture a professor that they suspected was hiding somewhere in the vicinity of Assisi. So, uh, but in any event, the reason why I'm showing this is because it's very, very similar to the situation in the Roman Empire after Constantine. So let her roll, Tom.
Professor Lee. Pleased to meet you. I have orders to send you to the Allied Command in Rome immediately, Professor. Lieutenant Jones will accompany you. Thank you very much. Victory! The uh, Christian army marches into uh, uh, the uh, the territory, and everybody all of a sudden's got a good taste in their mouth about Jesus Christ and His Church. Okay, and you would think, okay, happy ending, but okay, not exactly. Okay, the church was probably it varied from region to region in the Roman Empire. Uh, over the aggregate, and here here's a much better map of Rome than we had last week which I drew with my own hands, not this one, the other one. Uh, and, and certain areas, over the whole course of it, probably about 10%, okay, at the time of Constantine's victory. Bigger in certain areas. Uh, the real Christian heartlands were close to where Christ and the apostles, uh, you know, originally preached. Uh, Syria, uh, Asia Minor, definitely. Uh, also in Rome, in, in the areas around Rome. Uh, some of the areas around uh, Illyricum, a little bit in, in, in Gaul near Arles, a little bit in Spain near uh, uh, Caesar Augustus, Zaragoza, also a lot in Africa. But a real breadbasket for the empire and also for the Christian church was the ancient province of Egypt. Okay, why? Egypt was kind of the uh, cultural, ancient uh, populous, commercial, agricultural capital of the Roman Empire. So much grain came out of the Nile Valley and also at the time North Africa was quite fertile too there and that supplied the needs of the entire empire. Uh, they had, you know, they had the pyramids. They were in much better shape then than they are now. They, they had all these monuments. They didn't know, they couldn't read them anymore exactly what they, what they meant for sure. But they, but they were there. It was an impressive and ancient country. And the church had been established there from the beginning. The first bishop of Alexandria, which was an incredibly cosmopolitan city with a, the greatest library in the world, uh, all kinds of uh, amazing uh, technical things that uh, you know, didn't have really anywhere else in the, to the same level, the famous lighthouse. It was one of the wonders of the world. Uh, they actually had their own version of the Suez Canal going at that time. It didn't run along the line of the Suez Canal that we have now, but they, they, it ran from the Nile Delta to the Red Sea. So you could kind of go this way to uh, go around and you know, trade with, um, uh, with, Af with, uh, with Ethiopia or uh, Arabia or whatever you wanted. And you know, if you could go far enough, and some people were you know, <laughs> bold enough to do it, you could go all the way to India. Uh, but in any event, Egypt was originally evangelized by St. Mark. St. Mark, okay, who was alive when Christ, it was a young guy, when, when Christ was actually uh, conducting his ministry, who had been considered by especially Peter he, uh, as, as kind of a spiritual son. In fact, Peter calls Mark his son, okay, in, in, in his, his epistle. He ends up being the first Bishop of Alexandria, and the church took, there ended up being a school in Alexandria, a very famous uh, school with a lot of very famous early Christian writers and scholars who, uh, who studied that, at that school. And uh, the, the church was highly developed, and they had a gigantic persecution in several levels. Egypt had it at worst, well, just about worse than anywhere else in the empire because not only did they suffer the persecution of Diocletian, but they also suffered the persecution of the successors of, uh, of Diocletian, the successors of Galerius. Even what Constantine was ruling the West, some of these bad guys you know, were ruling the East and still having Maxima and Licinius, even to a certain degree, were, were uh, uh, really severely persecuting the Christians there. And there were tremendous heroes and also uh, tr uh, tremendous villains you know, that, that came out of it, because the paganism was also very, very strong in, in Egypt. So, and 
Judaism was very strong in Egypt uh, for even uh, for hundreds of years. They had a kind of a imitation temple near Alexandria that was modeled after the Temple of Jerusalem. In any event, uh, what uh, happens is uh, now that peace is, has arrived uh, to to the church. Uh, it, well, during one of the, uh, the people who had served well were now ruling the church of, of Alexandria, but not without a certain amount of difficulty. There were, every time the uh, persecution would be over, there'd be a little bit of bad feelings between people who had suffered, and they suffered, again, I mentioned severely uh, in Egypt. They, uh, usually when someone was captured or confronted with the need to sacrifice and they refused to do so, uh, they'd send them from Egypt to the mines somewhere. What, for, for, what? Libya. Libya or all, all other places too. But, without, but they'd also hamstring them, okay, chop you know, their tendons so they couldn't run very fast. And oftentimes for good measure, they uh, poke out one of the eyes, okay, just to make sure that these slaves aren't going to get frisky. So what they, uh, uh, now, if all of a sudden the church would always take this position, somebody said, you know, I, sorry, Father, I screwed up. I want to come back. I got scared. I lost my nerve. The church would generally, and this has been the, the, the rule of thumb for at least 100 years, say, okay, you know, uh, look, we'll, we'll, we'll let you back, but you're going to have to do penance, okay? But yes, we'll let you back. Well, a lot of people would say, no, don't let him back. My sister died in that persecution. We're going to let this bum back who was offering incense to ISIS or somebody like that? Absolutely not. He had his chance. He blew it. Forget about it, okay? And there was a, a group of uh, people who followed a guy named Miletius, okay, who were really leading, they, 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 they basically broke away from the bishop, Alexander, and called themselves the Church of the Martyrs, okay? And so they were already, there was a, like a, a schism a-brewing. But something even more insidious was also a-brewing. Uh, before I get to that, just to tantalize you with that for a minute, I want to mention uh, one person who really came through like a saint during the, the persecution, a uh, famous uh, father of the church called Anthony, known as the abbot. Not Anthony of Padua, okay, but uh, 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 Anthony of the desert, he's also called. This particular uh, Anthony uh, was uh, born a long time uh, before the end of the persecution. He was born around the, the time of the Valerian persecution, around 260. He was, he was actually you know, born close uh, a few years before that. Uh, he very interested uh, in uh, the Christian life, uh, wanted to uh, follow Christ literally, and so he ultimately came from a rich family, gave away everything uh, he had, and went out to seek the Lord in areas where he could not be found, where no one would bother him. Out to the desert he goes. And out there, uh, his, his life became uh, uh, extremely profound. Okay, He um, really took the spiritual life so seriously that he began to be known as someone who was extremely wise. You could get all kinds of advice from him, and it was uncannily good. Uh, very holy man, and people would, especially when the persecution started, all kinds of people said, hey, you know, the Romans aren't going to be looking out in sand hills or, you know, where, where not, nobody is. Let's go where Anthony is. We'll, we'll have a pretty good church going down out there, and nobody will bother us, and we can survive the persecution and also learn something from a holy guy. Uh, well, uh, uh, Anthony uh, uh, actually ended up being sort of a, a kind of exactly like an abbot of several different communities that he would go to from place to place that were out there in the desert, pretty far away from the long arm of the law. Uh, but he was also <laughs> such a saintly guy that when he heard that the persecutions were raging and roaring, okay, in places like Alexandria, He'd go in there. He'd go into Alexandria big and bold. 
he heard, hey, you know, uh, they, gee, they, they, they really arrested everybody at this one church. Uh, you know, they're all in jail. I'll go visit them. So he'd go visit him, and here comes this older guy, you know, beard and all, you know, looking like somebody like a, a, an Egyptian version of John the Baptist or something. And even the Romans were kind of nonplussed by, hey, who is this guy? Uh, I guess he's harmless, okay, if he wants to go talk to these guys in jail, fine. He, they, nobody arrested him. You know, they, they just didn't, kind of didn't even know what to do with him. But he would encourage the people in the jail to hang tough. Jesus is not far away. You'll be soon seeing him. You'll be looking out for the rest of us. Don't give up the ship. Hang in there. You know, uh, you can do it. And uh, then you go back to the desert. <laughs> okay. One of the people that went out, one family that went out to the desert to uh, see th this amazingly holy man, okay, kind of the Padre Pio of the ancient world, all right, uh, was a, a family with a young redhead son named Athanasius, okay. Athanasius was an ex extremely uh, uh, impre both impressionable and dynamic young man. Uh, you know, I'm the father of two redheads, okay, and my wife has red hi highlights in her hair, and living with red-headed uh, genes around, I mean, I can tell you it's a very dynamic existence, okay? <laughs> you know, they, they, there's something to every stereotype, there's a little something to it, and there was something here, too. Uh, when Athanasius would get his mind onto something, there was no stopping him. Uh, he was incredible. Incredibly impressed with the character, the courage, the holiness of St. Anthony the Abbot. And he actually even served as an altar boy to him. He, you know, he said, I remember washing his hands you know, with, the, with the water at the, at, the, at, the, at the liturgy. I mean, the guy was fantastic. And he, really, and he also he picked up a lot from him. He'd sit there and listen to him, tell about how, what are wonderful ways to find Christ, how you can see Christ and all these different things. And, uh, and listening to uh, uh, Anthony preach about Christ and talk about him is, is uh, talking about a good friend that, he, that Anthony knew very, very well and that Athanasius could know too if he really wanted to try to do it. So uh, anyway, the church becomes free. Uh, uh, Athanasius decides to enter holy orders. So he becomes a deacon first. And by the way, there were no seminaries in those days. Okay, kind of the, 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 the general way of becoming, entering holy orders was you would go to a bishop and start out, you know, if you wanted to do it, start out as a deacon. You know, they see how you do there. You know, then maybe if, you know, you can keep it going. You learn kind of on the job training. Uh, you'd go to the priesthood and, and, and there you go. It was the, the bishop who was going to give you the direction. The bishop was, who was going to decide that. Well, uh, Meanwhile, the thing that's a brewing starts to come to a boil. And what's that? There's a school. There, I mentioned the School of Alexandria. There's also a very famous school in Antioch. Okay. Now, of course, Antioch, famous, famous Christian center. Okay. It's the place, you know, uh, you know, Christians were there even before St. Paul was there. You know, Antioch was the first place where people were called Christians. Antioch was where the Gentile apostle really started going. It was, Antioch was for the place from which uh, Paul and Barnabas went to go start converting the rest of the world. Okay, uh, Ancient city, deep Christian tradition, also a lot of pagan stuff. There are a lot of, you know, wild, wild pagan shrines and pagan, like the Grove of Daphne and stuff like that, wild places out in Antioch. It, was, it had both. It had the good and the bad. But there was a school in Antioch formed by a very interesting guy named Lucian. Okay. Now, Lucian was, in a certain sense, way ahead of his time in a lot of things. And he lived, he died in around 312, okay, in the persecution of Maximin. Uh, he, uh, like a lot of intelligent people, okay, he liked to systematize everything, kind of figure it all out. And actually, he really did some excellent biblical study. I mean, he started comparing how words were used in different books of the Bible and trying to get a, you know, a generalized meaning out of them. And a, a brilliant guy, also a very defective, very uh, dynamic uh, and, and, and good teacher, but he had the problem that a lot of teachers had. You know, he starts thinking, hey, everybody kind of likes me. Everybody's kind of clapping for me. I kind of think I got this whole thing figured out. So he decided he was going to figure out exactly how Jesus is both God and man. Okay. 
Okay, if you could do that, tell me about it. Well, he did, okay. But again, when you try to figure it out, okay, and take what's been handed down, take God out of the picture, you come up with weirdness, okay, weird stuff, okay. There had been a guy that was one of his pals who had been the bishop of Antioch for a while named Paul of Samosata, and they came up with a kind of a wild theory together whereby Jesus was kind of, Jesus the man, and the, the school of Antioch emphasized very much continually the human, the humanity of Christ. You know, they didn't want to get off too far into too, too much spirituality. You kind of, it's like, hey, that's going to get you in trouble. Let's keep it, let's keep it simple, you know, stupid. So uh, what they, uh, he, they would emphasize that and they said, okay, what Jesus was, was kind of a, he was a man, okay, that God worked through, you know, that God infused. So, yes, uh, you know, the Son of God was in him, but that's how Jesus is God. And, well, all of a sudden, what happened? Everybody said, wait a minute, whoa, whoa, the other bishops hear about this. That's, you know, there's, that's cockeyed, okay, I don't know exactly why, but that's, you know, it just doesn't sound right. It doesn't sound like what, what's been handed down to us. Paul of Samosata gets you know, uh, excommunicated, okay, by the, the, the neighboring bishops. Uh, and Lucian sticks up for him, and Lucian gets excommunicated, okay. But he kind of, uh, he, he's excommunicated for a good 15 years or so, and preaching, you know, saying, oh, no, Paul Samuelson is right, Paul Samuelson is right. And then finally, though, uh, the world is kind of passing him by. So he says, well, you know, I, I maybe I ought to rethink this, okay. If I'm supposed to be outside the church, well, how can I, you know, call myself a Christian teacher? I got, I'll submit. Okay, I'll go along. Now, one of the, uh, and, and ultimately, Lucian gets martyred, as I mentioned, in 312. Okay, and he's, you know, actually popularly known as Saint Lucian. Okay, but he had some, took him a while, okay, uh, to, to, to get to orthodoxy. And he's not a father of the church because of, some, because of his heterodox ideas, some of his heterodox ideas. Now, one among the students of the school of Lucian there in Antioch, which survived him, okay, and continued after uh, Lucian even had straightened out, were uh, a guy named Arius, okay, who was originally from Libya, which is was the Egyptian jurisdiction, and a couple of guys named Eusebius. And by the way, during this period of time of church history, if you wonder, what the, if you forget the name of the guy, of one of the guys I'm talking about, think, bet on Eusebius, okay? Because uh, pretty much everybody who's anybody in, in this drama is going to be named Eusebius, both good, bad, and middle of the road, okay? Eusebius of Nicomedia, later, he later becomes the bishop of Nicomedia, Eusebius of Caesarea are both there, and they all kind of pick up the, uh, uh, the, the honeyed wine of Lucian to a degree, okay? They kind of like the idea because it explains everything. Arius goes back to uh, Egypt, okay, after he gets out of college, <laughs> after he gets out of school, and uh, he, uh, again, emphasizing the humanity of the thing, he kind of uh, uh, is all in favor of these guys, uh, these Miletian schismatics. He said, yeah, yeah, you guys, I agree with you. I mean, uh, you know, Lucian died, uh, and they're letting these guys back so easy. I, I think you, you guys are right, you know? And so the bishop basically uh, kicks Arius out. They said, you know, hey, you, you don't, um, you know, uh, you're not submitting to the authority of the church here. You know, you, you, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna give you any spot in the church. But Arius also then uh, says, okay, well, okay, I, you're the bishop, you do it the way you want, I, I, I submit. And so uh, now Arius is uh, uh, in a classic uh, polished manner. He was a very, uh, he came from some amount of money. He was very well spoken. He knew how to, he was talented. He could, he could speak in several languages, Coptic, Greek, Latin, you know, he could really throw it around. Also uh, Aramaic. 
uh, uh, Syriac. And so he uh, said, you know, uh, I think some of the stuff I learned from Lucian is exactly what we need in Egypt because this idea of Jesus being God, God, how's that going to work? That just, it's just, just impossible. Okay. But anybody can understand the idea of Jesus being son of God. Isn't, wasn't Hercules the son of Jupiter? So we, you know, the pagans will understand that. This is a way to get the pagans in if we get away from these kind of hackneyed ideas that some, you know, unwashed, old religion type Christians are preaching ignorantly. Okay, let's get this a little more sophisticated and we'll get the pagans coming into the churches and droves and maybe, maybe, maybe we'll even get the Jews. Because the Jews realize that, you know, the Messiah is coming. The, uh, many of the Jews believe it. Most of the Jews at this time believe in the preexistence of the Messiah. They just never wanted to think that Jesus was God the way the Father is God. You know, because if the Father is truly the Father, in generating the Son, the Son must have not existed at one time. Okay, so now we got it. Here's how it works, folks. God the Father is the God, you know, that we talk about in the Old Testament. Jesus is the Son of God, his first and best creation. And he's the one that came down to earth and, uh, you know, helped everything, everybody out. But, you know, there was a time when he didn't exist. All right, so all of a sudden, our buddy, Athanasius, who is a fiery young deacon, hears about this and says, oh, no, uh-uh, that's not what was handed down to us. Tom, let's show the next episode because uh, I think it kind of applies. Because the idea is, and it, 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 I'll tell you when to push it. What, uh, this is becoming very popular. Athanasius writes poems. He writes songs that sailors can sing. He writes songs, okay, that pull, pull this thing out. He writes a, like a poem called the Thalia that contains all kinds of ideas that popularize his, uh, his, new, his, his doctrine. And, uh, but what, and, and a lot of people start arguing about it. It becomes a, a grand, grand new thing. What's going to keep the church together and not follow this doctrine, Tom? It isn't easy. You may ask, why do we stay up there if it's so dangerous? Well, we stay because Anatevka is our home. And how do we keep our balance? That I can tell you in one word. Tradition! of our traditions. We've kept our balance for many, many years. Here in Anatevka, we have traditions for everything. How to sleep, how to eat, how to work, how to wear clothes. For instance, we always keep our heads covered and always wear a little prayer shawl. This shows our constant devotion to God. You may ask, how did this tradition get started? I'll tell you. I don't know. But it's a tradition. And because of our traditions, Every one of us knows who he is and what God expects him to do. 
All right. Tradition is what Athanasius says is on his side. Look. You've got all this news. This is the stuff that you're telling me and you're writing this tale and everything is not what St. Anthony, ta Anthony taught me. It's not uh, you know, what th was handed down to us. So he's wrong. He's denying the, the v basic point of the very first Christian creed. Okay, what was the first Christian creed? Jesus is Lord. What do you mean? Okay. Lord was the substitute word that the Hebrews put in instead of reading the famous four-letter name of God, Y-H-W-H, Yahweh. So they didn't substitute Adonai. Okay, we're saying Jesus is Adonai. Whoa! Okay, you know, that means Jesus is God. Yes! Okay, and one of the things I've got here is, uh, if, to, to look at if you want to take it home, is the... Uh, in the Gospel of St. John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made. Okay, in Him was life, and the light was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness grasped it not. Okay, boom! In other words, Jesus is God. Okay, uh, the epistle, in the Epistle to the Colossians, uh, you know, he's, there is the, the image. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. So you know, the, the divinity of Christ is the cornerstone of Christianity. Without with the whole salvation thing doesn't go. Without with the supernatural life can't really be communicated in the same way because to get it through somebody who is not God, you don't get it. It's not the same thing. In fact, um, Athanasius says he, he gets his bishop all lathered up. Okay. And he said, you know, this guy's got to go. I know he's in charge of a great big parish in a place called Vicalis, but he's, he's trouble. He's bad news. He's actually taking people away from the apostolic faith. Well, it becomes a big deal, okay, a, a gigantic big deal, such that, you know, people pro and anti Arius are, you know, fighting it out, okay, arguing it out all over the place. Word of it starts spreading outside of Egypt because and through his friends, like these two guys who are also prominent clerics in there. By the way, he wasn't in Nicomedia yet. He was in what we call now Beirut first. Okay, Be Beiritus, who was called then. Uh, he, uh, they, they're, on, they're on Arius. So we know Arius. We went to school with him. The guy's top-notch, great scholar. You know, we, we, should, we should listen to him. Well, uh, the word gets all the way to Rome. Okay. Now, in Rome, uh, Constantine is confused by this whole thing. He's not even a Christian yet. He doesn't, he doesn't know who's right. He talks to his old friend, Bishop Hosius, Osius, who was with him at the Milvian Bridge. He was a friend of his, his mom and uh, said, uh, uh, look, I, I need to go send you to go find out what's going on down there in Egypt. And it's spreading all over the place. It sounds to me like it's, it's cracking up the church. We don't need that. And we need, you know, nice Nice, peaceful. We don't want any kind of people going off different ways, you know, fighting with each other. We have peace and quiet, law and order around here. Go down there and find out who's right and what's going on because I don't understand it. All right, so Osius goes down and <laughs> he meets with the bishop and the bishop introduces him to Athanasius and the, they get him all pumped up. And they, he says, okay, you know what I think we got to do? We got to, uh, I got to go back and tell the emperor, yeah, this is a serious problem. And I think you ought to call a meeting of, of bishops so that they can all, uh, we, we can hammer this thing out together and uh, uh, you will have, uh, you know, uh, a hearing, okay? Both sides can come, uh, Arius can come, Athanasius can come, everybody can come, you know, and we'll let the, you know, the, the, the people who are the experts of this, the bishops, to decide what's going on, okay? And so first they call, uh, they decide to call it for, and I don't exactly know why, but in a place called Ankyra, which is in, out in central uh, Turkey. It's Ankara, okay? It's, it's the city that was, uh, or, you know, now is Ankara, okay? But uh, they said, no, that's too far away. Let's do it closer to Constantinople. So let's call everybody to come in at Nicaea, okay? And uh, that's near the capital, the new imperial capital, and it would be nice for everybody. They can come there. And, he, and I, me as the Emperor Constantine, I can come and see what's going on too and kind of give you moral support. So... About 318 bishops come. In the meantime, our friends Athanasius and Alexander have had their own little council in Egypt, and anathema said, okay, you know what that means. You're out. These uh, uh, Arius, 
is not preaching the Christian faith. He's outside the bounds of Christianity. Okay, and he's anathema. And so they, the two sides come loaded for bear. Okay, now Arius is there. He's, he's an elderly man at this time. Athanasius is a young guy. He's not even, not even 30 yet. You know, he, he, he's, 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 the, he's the bishop baron, okay, of, of, of the time. Okay, he's, he's ready to go. And uh, actually, a lot of interesting people came. I mean, some of the martyrs, the confessors come. You know, guys hobbling there on, on one leg, guys with one eye. And, you know, Constantine is impressed to the skies when he sees these guys, you know, walking into the uh, uh, convention hall, so to speak. And uh, uh, they all meet, and they, they hear it out. And uh, Eusebius takes the floor to speak for Athanasius, saying, no, no, he's, this guy, everything he says can be backed in the Bible. You know, uh, Athanasius, uh, Arius believes in the Bible. Arius is using terminology that is not in the Bible, like these things like Trinity and, of you know, one especially this word, which we know heretics have used, says homoousios, of consubstantial, of the same substance of the Father. And those things, I mean, heretics use that. Athanasius seems to want to use that to, to, to uh, emphasize, uh, you know, uh, uh, that uh, Christ, Jesus is God. Uh, that's, uh, that, that's no good. But again, Imagine this hard, this guy, this hard-driving Athanasius who makes, again, Bishop Barron look like he's asleep in the barber's chair, okay, gets up there and says, okay, Arius, I want to ask you some questions, okay. If Jesus is not eternal, if there was a, uh, you're saying that there was a time when God the Son did not exist, is that what you're saying? And Arius says, yes. Oh, you know, even the guys that didn't know what they were saying, they, we know that's not what's handed down. Jesus existed from all ages. Again, not Jesus. God the Son existed from all ages. Okay? And so it, uh, you're saying, Arius continues the cross-examination, that are you saying that perhaps Jesus could have changed? He could have turned against God the way Michael did. I mean, I'm sorry, the way, the way Lucifer did. Well, yes, I suppose that was possible, but he didn't. Oh, what do you mean? So Jesus would have been capable of evil? Well, yeah, no, heresy, out, ridiculous. Okay, so the, 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 the 318 fathers all sign a document kicking Arius out, saying this guy is totally out to lunch, does not belong in any Christian uh, uh, position whatsoever, and we're going to make ourselves a little creed just to make it nice and clear what we mean, uh, it's the Nicene Creed, we're going to use the term of one in substance with the Father, homoousius. Okay, so there's no confusion that Jesus is some kind of Hercules on steroids, spiritual steroids. Okay, it's no, no, he's way more than that. Okay, so uh, the meeting, except, uh, three bishops, three of the eight, 318 don't go along. They're excommunicated too. Uh, even Eusebius says, all right, you know, I'll go along, but I still am not condemning Arius. I think Arius is a great guy. I'm not condemning him. I think he's a holy and good priest, okay? But I'll sign the Nicene Creed. Okay, so he signs. So they go back. Uh, now, they have a great big banquet, you know, like a convention hall thing, and uh, Constantine comes himself. He, he's showering favors on uh, the bishops there. And everything looks, you know, happy ending, okay? Back they go to their respective cities. But, 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 you know, when people have an agenda, they don't quit so easily, especially because now with this new change in politics, we've got a whole new dimension to being a bishop. We start creating something for the first time called court prelates. Okay, what are court prelates? Okay. They're bishops who are in good with the big boys, okay? Uh, you know, before you be a bishop, you go to jail, okay? Do not pass go, do not collect 200, okay? But now when you're a bishop, okay, maybe you're going to be riding alongside the emperor like Osius did. Hey, that's pretty nice, okay? Maybe they're going to give, maybe the emperor will give you a palace or something like that if he kind of likes you. Hey, that's nice too, you know? So, uh uh, some opportunist, now it's an opportunity to be a bishop, and that's not lost on some people, especially like Eusebius of Nicomedes. Hey, you know, there's a lot of power here, you know, and I can do a lot of good, of course, and close to the emperor, you can tell the emperor what he wants to hear, and he can help out. Yes? Does St. Sylvester play a role in here? 
St. Sylvester sent Osius and one other Roman priest as his legates uh, to uh, convoke the Council of Nicaea. So the two Roman priests, one of which was, was Osius, are the Pope's representatives at the Council of Nicaea. Uh, so uh, Alexander dies, okay, uh, shortly after uh, 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 Nicaea. And uh, the people decide, well, you know what, what we got to do, uh, 328, uh, we want to have uh, Bob Barron, okay, so to speak, okay, area, uh, Athanasius, Athanasius, God forbid, Athanasius be the new bish, patriarch of Alexandria. And so a uh, young guy, barely 30, 29 years old, becomes a bishop of the third most important see in Christendom, a see which is very close ties to the Church of Rome because it was founded as an offshoot of Rome, founded from Rome by Mark, the disciple of Peter. And uh, Athanasius, with his usual energy, becomes a great bishop. Okay, he goes up and down the Nile, visiting places, uh, you know, congregations of people, beefing them up, uh, making sure that the priests are educated and so forth, uh, uh, making sure that the, the poor are being taken care of, reconciling people back to the church, and doing a, a bang-up job. He's also enforcing church discipline a little bit. Uh, there, some of these places, particularly under persecution, uh, started getting a little fast and loose with, uh, uh, you know, apostolic succession. Uh, you know, there was a, a, in one of the little towns in Nile Delta, there was a little congregation that not only were holding out, you know, uh, having little prayer meetings, but they decided to say mass for themselves. Okay, nobody's ordained, you know, and so uh, uh, he said, no, 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 hey, you can't, you, just because you want to say mass doesn't mean that you can say mass, okay. You got to be ordained. You have to be in line. You have to be receive, you know, this gift through the apostolic succession. You guys didn't, so uh, no. Okay, yeah, we're, we'll send you a priest, but you this you, you cannot confect the Eucharist just by yourself. Just because you're wanting to, you have to have authority to do that. You don't have the authority. We got to straighten that out. Well, uh, some of those guys were a little mad <laughs> that it happened, particularly one of the priests there. And the story, uh, so what is this guy, Iskris, okay, who is, who is the kind of wildcat fake priest, starts going over to the, uh, the angry Miletians and says, hey, did you see what Athanasius did? Who the heck does he think he is? You know, he's throwing his weight around. I'm the holy guy. I got the right to say mass. This is like anybody else. I should be able to say mass if you guys want me to say mass. I don't need a bishop to tell me I can say mass. I can do it on my own. And so uh, the story, uh, the Miletians eat that up and they say, yeah, yeah, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah, they, we never liked these guys. Anyway, they're too soft. They're letting all these jerks, that, you know, apostatize right back into the church just like everybody else. No, yeah. And so uh, the story keeps getting bigger and bigger. Okay. First it gets, the, not only did he shut down a mass, that he ripped the chalice out of the hand of Iscris, uh, Iscris. And, uh, you know, he, uh, they, you know, the Eucharistic species was spilled on the floor, even though they weren't, you know, consecrated by a legitimate priest. You know, it was all kinds of, you know, sacrilege, evil, all kinds of stuff. And, and so now this word gets back to Eusebius. And it's, ah, just what I wanted. Okay, because we got to get Arius back. He got, Arius got a railroad job at, at uh, Nicaea. And uh, I think uh, I've been talking to the emperor, and I think I'm getting, the emperor's starting to see uh, the right way here that Arius is just, you know, an advanced theologian. You know, he's just, uh, you know, he's just somebody that, uh, that he believes the same stuff. I mean, but he just believes in a little bit different way, okay? And it's okay. And, uh, but the problem is Ar uh, Athanasius. Athanasius will not let this forward thinker free reign to present the, the teachings of the church in a new and exciting way. And so he, uh, you know, he's got to go, but he's too popular. Okay. People, uh, uh, you know, after all the, you know, for years going up and down the Nile and, you know, being a, a roll up your sleeves, uh, hands on brick and mortar, so to speak, or, a, uh, you know, a mud and brick, uh, you know, uh, uh, a priest uh, and bishop, uh, you know, uh, he's too popular. He's, he's a good preacher. He's, he's so dynamic. He's full of zeal. How are we going to stop people from listening to him and to start listening to Arius? Ah, the age old way. Let's, let's start spreading stories about him. And it, you know, let's get a smear campaign going. 
okay? And they start, they start finding people who heard about what happened at this little, you know, wildcat church, and they build it up into the greatest sacrilege uh, you can possibly imagine. And they, for good measure, uh, you know, to get people to get start maybe being angry with Athanasius and to get Constantine maybe Athanasius, they start spreading rumors that, you know what he was doing too, when he was going down, up and down the Nile, <laughs> he started you know, helping himself to some of the hometown honeys, you know? And so, sure, he's a young guy, he's a fiery guy, and he, that fire, you know, sometimes gets spread around, okay? And uh, no, he, he's, a, he's not a good priest, okay? He's, he's a disgrace to the priesthood. He's, uh, he's rigid. He, he's overbearing. He's insensitive. And, you know, he's, he, he's got to go. And uh, they start spreading this around, and the Aryan people know that Athanasius is the Aryan sympathizers, his biggest um, enemy. And uh, so they, uh, they, they start spreading all, all these rumors up and down the East Mediterranean and gets all the way to Constantine. And Constantine, uh, Eusebius says, you know, I think we've got to have something here. We, gotta have, we, we, we better call another one of these councils, you know, because Athanasius is causing so much trouble. I mean, you know, and he, he's, he's preventing, you know, good people from being reconciled with the church like Arius, and he wants, Arius wants to come back. Uh, let's have a little, uh, let's have another council like you had before. And I'll run it for you, okay? And so they call a council at Tyre, famous Tyre and Sidon, here in modern Lebanon, okay, uh, there. And they, they summon a bunch of people. And basically the council is to decide a couple of things. One, what's the status of Athanasius? I mean, does he fit to be a uh, archbishop or a patriarch or whatever you want to call him in contemporary terms? Uh, or uh, uh, should all these accusations, all these horrible things, I mean, these people have a right to be heard. I mean, this is all really bad stuff. You know, we got to see, you know, what's, what's going on here. Uh, you know, he was outrageous uh, from, from, uh, from what we can hear from these accusations. We, 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 we better have him come and decide whether he ought to be bishop or not. In the meantime, I think there's enough evidence, okay, says uh, Eusebius, that we ought to have a temporary administrator appointed for Alexandria until the council can meet and, and, and figure this whole thing out. So they call a council at, at Tyre and they pack it with their guys. In the meantime, but again, you're not, they, they didn't quite calculate with the guy that they were dealing with. Athanasius, this hard-driving guy who'd never give up, die hard if there ever was one. I mean, it makes Bruce Willis, you know, and, and the die hard movies look mild, okay? He says, okay, uh, I, guys, we got to find this guy that uh, uh, is spreading all these rumors. We got to find their source and find out what he's really doing. And meanwhile, the stories are getting worse. They, they said, Athanasius killed the guy. Okay, that's why the guy isn't around. He actually killed the guy. He cut off his hand, okay, and he used the hand for magical rites, okay. And they actually bring the hand to Tyre. They say, this is the hand that Athanasius cut off. Look at this, look at this. Well, Athanasius sends his buddies out to try to go find the guy, and they find him. They find him. Okay, he's actually in a, uh, hiding out in a monastery that heats on, uh, but, you know, he's keeping a low profile, and sure enough, through word of mouth, because Athanasius is really popular among the, you know, the brick-and-mortar Catholics of, of Alexandria and, and, and Egypt, and uh, they said, okay, we know who you are. You, you got both hands, okay? You're alive. We're taking you to Tyre, and we're going to show people that not only are you not dead, you're alive, you got, you got two hands, okay? Uh, nobody did anything. So, uh, big and bold. Athanasius goes into Tyre, uh, and you know they, uh, there's all kinds of interesting stories going on. Okay, they 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 bring in um, a woman, okay, who says uh, he seduced me, he beat me, he raped me, and they're saying all this kind of stuff. And so uh, they pull it, they, they pull a little trick on on, on her. Uh, they uh, uh, one of Athanasius's friends said, "Are you saying?" Lady, that I did that to you? And she said, yes, you did, you wicked Athanasius. It wasn't Athanasius. Athanasius is over here. <laughs> Sorry, lady, you got the wrong guy. Okay. And so, uh, and also, too, uh, uh, they, 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 they bring up other people. They say, did you, is it true uh, that, you, uh, that you saw Athanasius kill Iscris and cut off his right hand? Yes, absolutely true. Uh, would you recognize Iscris if you saw him? Absolutely. I'll never forget it. 
post-traumatic stress syndrome, I mean, it's affected me all my life. So they had the guy under a hood, they said, okay, recognize this guy, <laughs> is this the guy you're talking about? Hold out your hands, Iskris, okay. <laughs> you know, so the thing becomes a circus, okay. And uh, now, again, not being stupid, okay, and, and no one ever said Athanasius was stupid, he decided to, uh, he knew this was a kangaroo court, he knew the deck was stacked against him, so again, big and bold, John Wayne style, he goes writing, he, he leaves the Council of Tyre, he says, they can make whatever accusations they want, they're going to do what they're going to do, I'm going to Constantinople, I'm going to talk with Constantine myself, okay, and uh, sure enough, meanwhile, you know, Constantine had been totally poisoned against Athanasius by all the rumors and the, the, the character assassination that uh, Eusebius had been feeding him about him. Uh, he had met him before and he thought he was a very good guy, but he, again, he says, well, you know, I don't really know that much about it as, as, as Eusebius does, so I'll kind of, uh, you know, de defer to him. But uh, you know, um, Athanasius tracks him down on a hunting trip and he finds him and he tells him his story. And once again, uh, Athanasius has this personality that is so straightforward, uh, deeply soaked in prayer. I mean, very, very fine guy. And um, Athanasius, uh, Constantine starts to kind of, starts to wonder a little bit. But meanwhile, Eusebius comes galloping in too. He finds out about it after you know a few weeks. And he finally plays the final face card. He said, look, you can believe me, your highness, or you can believe Athanasius, but here's something that can't be disputed. Athanasius has got way too, he, he's got a personal following. He's setting himself up as a kind of a, a, a figurehead down there in Alexandria, the breadbasket of Constantinople. Uh, uh, he, uh, he, I've heard him say that he could cut off the grain shipments to Constantinople like that. Did you say that? Did you say that? I never said that, Your Highness. He said it. How could I? I don't control any grain. I don't run any ships. You're a rich man. You can do whatever you want. Okay. So Constantine says, you know, I can't take any chances. Okay. I don't know if you're guilty or not, but you're going away. Okay. You're, uh, I'm sending you to exile so that you can cool your jets and maybe somebody else will figure this thing out. But I don't want you fostering dissension in Alexandria. So poor old Athanasius has to leave and they send him all the way up here on the border of Germany. So across the Mediterranean Sea, across Italy, across the Alps, all the way to where you know, the guys are coming with the, wearing the, uh, uh, the furry uh, uh, scarves and stuff, are ready, battle axes to, uh, to attack Rome. He's right on the borderline there. And, and, but meanwhile, he doesn't quit. Okay? He's there for a number of years. While he's there, he starts writing, he, he, he occupies himself, starts writing the history of the life of Anthony of the Desert, okay? And by the way, during this period of time, Anthony of the Desert comes out and he, he starts going around Alexandria again and going around the other cities to Egypt and says, hey, don't believe the rumors about Athanasius. I have known him since he was a kid. He's saying what I told him. You know, he's a good boy. He's a good bishop, okay? And uh, these other guys, the Arius, are all what? They don't preach Christian doctrine. That's not, that's not what was handed down to us. So, uh, all, uh, in 337, Eusebius, he had worked Constantine so well that uh, Constantine was ready to order the bishop of Constantinople to uh, receive Arius formally back in the church. Arius is an old man this time, pushing 90, probably about 87, something like that. But he's going to be received in his old age triumphantly into the church and the bishop of Constantinople prays, God, I don't want to see this. I, I'm on the side of the Nicene Creed, and I'm on the side of Athanasius. Uh, either take me or take Arius, you know, but don't let him you know, be received into the church in, in good standing. And sure enough, uh, the, uh, the, on the day that Arius is supposed to be received into the church, he collapses. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he actually... You know, he he immediately he he gets quite frankly a case of the runs. <laughs> okay, he, he, so he runs to the to the nearest privy. Okay, and all his guts you know completely fall. He dies. 
Okay. So they said, uh, okay, well, I guess Arius never made it back into the church. Okay. Uh, but Constantine dies within uh, a, a short period of time. And now we've got, again, a whole new change. Okay. We've got a whole new government, new people involved. The empire is divided among Constantine's three surviving sons. They all have similar names. <laughs> One is called Constantine II, and they give him Britain, Gaul, and Spain. The other is called Constans. He's a young kid. He's just basically maybe 15 years old, 14, 15 years old. They give him Italy and Africa. And the rest, the East, they give to a guy named Constantius the second. Now these guys have vastly different sympathies. This guy loves the Arians, and he loves Eusebius, and Eusebius had ingratiated himself with him, and so he's just going to be fill right in the thing. Constance is Catholic. He's friends with Osius, okay, the old codger that was with the Constantine at the Milvian Bridge. He likes the Nicene way. Constantine II is kind of neutral. He can go either way, okay? He doesn't really know that much about it, but he's open to both sides, okay? Mostly, though, more leaning, because he's in the West, toward, uh, leaning toward the, where the Catholic side. Uh, the, there's a new pope, too. Pope Julius the first. Julius is a good guy. And he says, look, what we need here, uh, 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 oh, immediately both sides send to uh, Julius uh, notes, uh, uh, their versions of the story. Uh, Eusebius tells Julius that uh, uh, Athanasius is a, a gigantic troublemaker. He's trouble from the word go. It's his way or the highway. Uh, he's causing tremendous dissension in the church. He's, he, he's no good. You know, the church is, a, is in an uproar all because of uh, Athanasius. Uh, he, he ought, he's got to be condemned. He's got to be stopped. He, he's relying on you know, theological terms that have you know, potentially bad meanings. Uh, he, 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 he's, he's totally bad news. Meanwhile, uh, uh, again, um, Athanasius, who he, during, after the death of Constantine, you know, he had been, you know, there's a kind of a general amnesty. He had been kind of allowed to go back to Alexandria for a while. He says, you know what, I, I'm going to go to Rome myself. I'm going to talk to Julius myself and, uh, uh, and tell him the story. Uh, and, uh, basically, I, uh, I'm in trouble because I'm just saying that I won't quit that Jesus is God. And that's, that's the end of that. So, uh, what happens is uh, uh, Julius decides, uh, he's very, very impressed both by uh, Athanasius and some of these monks that he brings with. And monastic life at this point had not really taken on in, uh, in the West, in Italy or Gaul or, or that. They didn't know anything about it. They didn't know this concept of you know, trying to seek you know, a complete renunciation of the world and to seek you know, God you know, absolutely 100%, you know, no holds barred, you know, the, the kind of the religious life type concept. And these monks that uh, Athanasius brought with were really good, good guys, very, very impressive people. And everybody was pretty darn impressed. They said, you know, gee, these guys, you talk about giving it all to God. I mean, <laughs> I mean, the, other than martyrdom, I mean, this is the next best step. I mean, these guys are, 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 are really kind of amazing. And they, they make a very good impression on the Pope and on, uh, on pretty much, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the people that surround the Pope uh, in, in Rome. And so uh, the Pope says, you know what, I, I, I'm on your side, Athanasius. I think you're right. What we got to do is we got to call a council. We will call a council now. And we'll call a council in a place called Sardica, which is right on the border between the East and the West, Eastern Roman Empire and the Western Roman Empire, so both sides could go. And, um, uh, the, uh, and then we'll, uh, you know, we'll proclaim this you know, to, uh, to the whole church. And um, so they, he, they go out there, and it, it becomes, a, again, another political football. Uh, Constantius... And Eusebius handpicked their guys to go out to Sardica. Uh, they want 
uh, to make sure that Athanasius is condemned. Uh, uh, the Western bishops come out there, and the, and the Egyptian bishops too, and they, they have a different viewpoint. So ultimately, the council breaks into two parts. You know, the Aryan favoring bishops leave, go down the road a few hundred miles, hold their own council, okay, proclaim a creed that is not at all like the Nicene Creed, not, not the Nicene Creed. Uh, and in fact, the reason why they left is because uh, the delegates of, uh, of the Pope said, okay, well, we're, we're, here's where we ought to start. We already got a creed developed, you know, at Nicaea. Let's have everybody say this creed to show that we're all on the same page. Oh, no, oh, no, not that creed. Oh, no. Okay. So half of, you know, half of them leave. Okay. They create their own council in a place called Philopolis. And meanwhile, Sardica, you know, they, uh, they vindicate Athanasius. By the way, Sardica is in 343. And, uh, you know, say, you know, he's... Uh, 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 he's right. Uh, Arius you know, was indeed a, a, a heretic, and uh, we're not going to uh, you know, go along with that. And uh, Constantius is furious, and so what he tries even to do is, again, uh, and I don't know who exactly, uh, whether he tried or Eusebius tried, somebody tried, to compromise this particular uh, 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 decision, Sardica uh, by trying to physically compromise uh, some of the bishops that were in charge with delivering the message of Sardica to the Eastern Roman Empire. So what they do is they hire a prostitute. And they have the prostitute waiting in basically the room of the inn where these bishops are supposed to be. And she's ready for business, okay? And these, uh, uh, now they, they didn't count on that there's honor everywhere. You, can, you, you never know where you're going to find honor. Because they didn't tell the prostitute that this was going to be an elderly bishop that was coming into the room. They just said, we got a, we got a young man for you. you know, they, we're paying for it. I mean, this is, you know, uh, yeah, we're, we're going to take care of this guy, and we want you to take care of him. So this uh, young uh, uh, lady, okay, uh, sees uh, this bishop coming in, you know, with uh, priest garb on, and she's shocked. So wait a minute, I, I'm not going to do this, okay? And the, the whole thing backfired on them. You know, they, she, she went out screaming, okay? So they tried to get me to bed down with a bishop, okay? I didn't want to do that, okay? And you know, it made the, it, it, it kind of, back, it, it made the anti-papal, people look very bad, okay? It made the anti-Athanasian people look very bad. They lost a lot of face. They lost a lot of ground. And so at this point, uh, Constantius says, you know what, maybe, maybe we just better uh, uh, make uh, uh, kind of a peace here. You know, we've been in schism, you know, from uh, the, the Western Church, the Church of Rome, for, for a number of years now. You know, we've been going our way with a kind of an Aryan formula. They've been going their way with the Nicene formula. Let's, let's just stay out of it a little bit. We'll let Athanasius go back. Okay, yeah, whoever, we will never know, okay, who, who did this dastardly thing of trying to compromise these bishops, okay? But uh, we, uh, you know, that certainly shouldn't have been done. And we'll let, uh, uh, you know, we'll let Athanasius go back to Alexandria. So he does go back. And for 10 years, from about 346 to 356, they have what's called the Golden Decade there. Now, after all of this exile and all of this innuendo and all of this character assassination, he had gone through a purgatory. And going through this purgatory, he became better than ever. He was more full of zeal, uh, more compassionate. Uh, more, closer to the people than ever. And all kinds of great stuff starts happening in Egypt. All kinds of people start converting. All kinds of people start going into these monasteries. Okay? The church starts getting very, very powerful and very, uh, 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 and, and they're, and they're all you know, by, you know, going uh, very strong in, in the uh, Nicene direction. Eusebius, though, was not to give up, and neither really was Constantius, because in um, uh, about 350 A.D., okay, midway between in this golden decade, uh, a, a revolution takes place against Constans, 
by uh, a, a Roman general, and uh, ultimately that guy uh, wins, okay, against Constance. Constance is dead. So now the protector of the Catholics is gone. Constantine II had already been gone. He was defeated in battle uh, in, in a different campaign uh, earlier. And so uh, now Constantius, if he defeats this guy, uh, Magnesius, he, Mag Magnentius, he is uh, then going to be ruler of the entire shebang, the whole Roman Empire. It's going to be Constantius's. And so he, 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 he does uh, defeat him. He says, now, with, with that trouble gone, now we can kind of straighten the church out the way I think it should be straightened out, the way Eusebius is telling me. And I'm not going to, you know, uh, let anybody else tell me anything different. And certainly not that little red uh, menace gets down there in Alexandria. Okay. So he, now the Pope, his new Pope, 352, a guy named Liberius. Liberius first starts out, you know, he's, he's with the Orthodox faction. I mean, he's, he's okay. He likes uh, Athanasius. He likes the Nicene Creed. Uh, he's, he, you know, he says this is this is this is the right way. I mean, this is this has all already been decided by the church. This is good, but uh, uh, Constantius uh, uh, sent, or and Constantius sent through Eusebius sends him all kinds of things to make him maybe change his mind. Hey, we got a nice donation here for the Church of Rome, and we also have some books for you to read. You know, along with that, to kind of that are kind of a new view that is much more exciting than, you know, what uh, Athanasius has been telling you. You know, I, I get, uh, it makes this whole thing much more understandable with the relationship with God and Jesus, the Holy Spirit, who's actually under both of them, you know. Uh, just like the, the Father creates Jesus, well, then Jesus creates the Holy Spirit. So that's how you got the three of them going, and each one is a little bit different. It's kind of very platonic, you know. It's almost like a, a, a platonic pyramid, and they all fit in, but it's different, Okay. And uh, Liberia says, no, no, take your gift back. I'm not going to go for any of that. You know, that's, you, you can't bribe me, okay? I'm not going there. Okay. Well, uh, uh, Constantius is furious. He says, well, I think you're one person. We better, uh, if you don't really understand this, maybe you haven't, you know, you're not smart enough. We're going to call some councils here. We'll call a council in Arles. And we're going to call later then a council in Milan. And uh, he sends his ruffians and himself to both councils. And when bishops come in, they kind of put their finger in their chest and then say, hey, you, uh, when discussions are going to be made, I want you to open your ears, okay, and open your heart and kind of think about something. And uh, I want you to consider the view that I think is right. And I think Athanasius is a bum. And I think that you ought to, uh, you know, go along with a, a much more... Um, intelligible view of Christianity than what he's preaching. So uh, uh, these two councils, oh, and they, there's a couple of bad guys, okay, who are actually the papal legates. Uh, Constantius gets to these papal legates, Ursatius and Valens, and uh, wins them over. <laughs> hey, you know, you don't, you know, uh, you, you, you're going to go a lot higher with being my friends than you're going to go with, uh, you know, uh, you know, some fanatic down from uh, uh, Egypt, okay? Uh, I want you, okay, to, uh, uh, as papal legates now, to uh, influence uh, and uh, use your good persuasive ability to help these synods turn out the right way. And, of course, they do turn out the right way for Constantius, which is the wrong way, okay, as far as the Nicene Creed and stuff goes. And uh, Liberius said, this is outrageous. Both of these things are completely wrong, okay? So uh, now uh, uh, Constantius decides, this is, this, is, this is uprising now, okay? This is dissension. You know, this is rebellion. So we, there's only one way to uh, uh, stop a rebellion, and that's to stamp it out, okay? So he starts, he, he sends troops down to... Uh, uh, all kinds of places, uh, first to Spain, and he says, we're going to get that old codger Osius, he's about 100 years old, but everybody likes him, and he, if he starts, if he caves in to an Aryan creed, people will know that that's the right way. So basically, they put him under, they put this old guy under the whip, okay, and he caves, 
and ultimately caves. So he said, okay, I'll sign, I'll sign, I'll sign. Okay, good. Oh, she has to sign. Okay. And then they go, they, they, they evade Alexandria. And they said, you know, uh, with condemnation, from these councils, condemnations of Athanasius. And say, okay, Athanasius got to go. He's a troublemaker. He's, he's a wild man. He's disobedient. He's, uh, he's been guilty in the past. He's been accused of uh, uh, sexual abuse. He's been accused of uh, all kinds of things. Uh, you know, it's a sacrilege, sorcery, you name it. He's done it, okay? He, he thinks he's a one-man emperor and he's got to go. And uh, 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 Athanasius gets out uh, uh, just in time. Okay, he, he's the people. He's very, still very popular with the people. Uh, they spirit him, uh, and for six years, he's an underground bishop and an underground priest. The, meanwhile, they put in a guy who, as uh, uh, a guy named George of Cappadocia, who was, had been, before he became bishop of Alexandria, a dealer in pork, okay, uh, literally, okay, he was a hog seller to the Roman army, okay, but they, he's the new pious bishop of Alexandria, okay, and they put him in the cathedral there, okay, everybody listen to, you know, uh, uh, George here, and uh, uh, meanwhile, Athanasius, though, again, is undaunted. During this time, he's doing all kinds of writing. He's writing in defense of the Holy Trinity. He's uh, you're, uh, you're writing a history of the Arian thing. He's, um, uh, you know, and he's spreading. He, he appears in towns, gives a sermon, goes back underground. He's a lot like back a few, several hundred years later, a thousand years later, uh, Edmund Campion, you know, like he's a kind of an underground, underground bishop. And very effective, you know, he, when, when's Athanasius going to be next? He, he's almost like a Zorro, you know, you, you never know when he's going to pop out and, you know, uh, carve the mark of the A, you know, uh, uh, you know somewhere in, in, in a church you know, and, 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 the, and the triangle of the Holy Trinity, okay? So uh, uh, he becomes almost a mystical figure. The Romans are anxious to try to, uh, to, to wipe him out. But the guy they really got to get to go along is Liberius. All right, so they said, okay, now we, we've, we've gone to Spain, we've gone to Alexandria, we're, we're persecuting the uh, Orthodox, okay, in, in Syria and in, 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 in Asia Minor. We got to get Liberius. And so in 356, 357, they go to Rome and they said, okay, last chance, condemn Athanasius, accept the creed of the Council of Milan. And you'll remain here as bishop. If not, I say that you're really outside the church. You're not really uh, pope. You're not really bishop of uh, our, our city. And so uh, you're going bye-bye. And he said, well, I guess I'm going bye-bye because, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to sign your creed. Okay. So they take him uh, off to way out to modern Bulgaria. And they keep him under wraps for two years. They pull a Lech Valencia on him, okay? You don't know what happened to him. And meanwhile, they insert into Rome a guy named Felix. They said, this is your bishop now, okay? This is, this, is, this, is, this is the head of the church. This is Felix. He's a good man. And actually, in the, in Felix, uh, you know, wasn't a uh, diehard Arian. He was really more on the Catholic side, okay? But he... Uh, he, he wasn't Liberius, and he was going to keep his head down, and basically, as far as Constantius was concerned, that's just about all that he needed. He needed Liberius out of there. And uh, after about two years of torture, privation, starvation, perhaps beating, uh, you know, uh, they present various heretical formulas for Liberius to sign. Okay, and they said, okay, here's what you got to do. You want to go back home to Rome? All you have to do is sign on the dotted line. Now, a lot of good bishops have signed these creeds. You know, these are fine. You know, uh, everybody likes, and a lot of people, people you like, okay, have said Athanasius is a troublemaker and a big problem for the church. He's no good for the church. He, he, he's way too hard line. You know, he's got to go. Uh, you do you 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 condemn Athanasius and you uh, uh, you say that he's no good and you sign this thing, uh, uh, the, one of these creeds and uh, and you'll go home. You can go back to Rome. You know we'll even let you be bishop along with Felix. So you, you can be bishops together. And uh, he ultimately signs. He signs, but he signs an ambiguous formula. 
Okay, he, uh, writing at the time, uh, Athanasius in his letters, says they knew that if they could take Liberius, they could take everything. Okay, so uh, he signs a formula that is capable of interpretation in both an orthodox and a heterodox way, and ambiguous, almost like an ang you know, like an Anglican type, you know, uh, vague formula that you could read it either way. He signs that. But he adds a little bit, but I want to emphasize that Jesus is like the Father in all things and even in essence. All right, all right, men, you just signed it. You can put your little codicil on there, but that's it. But he also signs a condemnation of Athanasius. So now they're trumpeting, okay, everybody, everybody's against Athanasius. It's Athanasius against the world. You know, he's condemned, you know, even now by Liberius, who had been Pope of Rome. In fact, we're, we're sending Liberius back. They let him go back to Rome. And they said, now, okay, people of Rome, you like this old Liberia? Oh, because like, Felix wasn't playing very well in Rome at all. Uh, he wasn't very popular. They knew they didn't like the idea of having a fake uh, uh, pope, you know, shoved down their throat. Uh, he only had a few followers, and so uh, 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 you know, uh, when Liberius comes back in, and the, the the imperial guard says, "Now you can have two bishops ruling jointly," uh, a riot breaks out. They said, "Oh no, 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 no! One Christ, one faith." One bishop, that's it, okay, not two. And they drive Felix out of Rome, okay? Liberius is back, and he keeps a little profile. But what about Athanasius, okay? Athanasius says, you know, I don't take this seriously, okay? If he's, uh, uh, if, if uh, Liberius, poor guy, you know, was under the whip, uh, you know, like Osius was, uh, you know, it's under duress, you know, I don't consider that uh, a legitimate denunciation. Uh, you know, that's not a free thing. Uh, I, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to keep going, Okay. Uh, but the, he's, the whole thing is underground. So in the year 357, for a couple years thereafter, the entire world, okay, and the bishops of the entire world, with a few exceptions, which is some of the more prominent ones I'll name, are uh, all the official people sitting in the equivalent of the Episcopal chairs. Certainly in Constantinople, you, by the way, Eusebius had gotten himself appointed to be Patriarch of Constantinople at this time. So now he got his wish. So he's the Pope of the New Rome, okay? And in Alexandria, you got old George in there. In Antioch, you got a couple of other, uh, uh, you know, uh, goofy guys uh, that are fighting it out as, uh, as uh, uh, Arian bishops there. Uh, but you also and he have an underground going. And the underground is guys like uh, uh, Athanasius, and some other guys that are in Antioch doing the same thing, that are in, in correspondence and league with Athanasius. And you got the people that are supporting these guys. And you got guys, uh, St. Hilary, our good friend Father Hilary, named after him, is also in exile, okay, because he's not uh, kowtowing. Uh, he, he refused to sign the Arian creeds. And uh, uh, he's keeping things going in Gaul and Germany, you know, the areas of exile where he is, uh, he's still uh, uh, fighting things too. But the, the, you know, they're, they're not particularly, the, the uh, Constantius is not particularly concerned about him because he's got 90% of the bishops with him. He's got all officialdom with him. He's got creeds, you know, by ersatz councils that are with him. The only thing he doesn't have are these diehards, and eventually they'll die, okay? Even diehards have to die, okay? So he thinks, I've got time on my side. St. Jerome, later on, looking back on this, you know, 30-some uh, uh, years later, said, you know, the world woke up one morning and groaned because they found that they had left the Catholic faith, and they, had not, they were now all Arians, okay? That was the... the the legal doctrine of the church throughout the entire Roman Empire. There was probably no darker moment in the history of the church than this period of time from 357 to 360 AD. How did we get out of it? Okay. How did they, you know, why do we say the Nicene Creed at Mass now? Okay. Well, because as I mentioned before last week, sometimes out of nowhere, all of a sudden, God says, enough. Okay. Things that I have nothing to do with church at all, okay? But God will all of a sudden take the chessboard, throw the pieces off, and set it up anew all himself. And, with, and the way that that happens is with a guy named this, Julian. Julian was part of the Constantinian family, a sure relative of them. 
He says, I don't like Constantius. His people killed my father, killed my brother. I don't like him at all. I don't like anything about him. I'm making a, 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 I'm popular with the troops out here in Gaul. I'm fighting Germans. I can easily go fight Constantius and his guys. Constantius is busy. He's fighting Persians. because The Persians are always ready to pounce on the Roman Empire, and he's, he's fighting them. He, so now he says, okay, now i got to contend with this. Okay, I'm going to go fight Julian. And Julian rejects Christianity completely. He says, anything Constantius is with, I'm against. So I'm going to go back to the ancient gods. They make a lot more sense to me anyway. Easier to understand, but much more like, uh, like we are. I'd like them better. Beautiful, handsome, you know, I could, I could relate to them rather than some invisible god. Uh, it's certainly not uh, Jesus Christ. I mean, the pale Galilean, I, I, I don't like him. I like, you know, Apollo much better. So uh, he goes to war with Constantius, beats him, okay? And now Julian is in charge of the whole Roman Empire. And so, so Julian, who hates everything about Constantius, says, okay, any bishops that Constantius kicked out, I want to put back. Because his idea is, let these Christians tear each other apart like a cat fight. You know, let them all fight the smithereens. And meanwhile, we'll get the temples going. We'll be having a great old time over there. Uh, a lot easier religion to follow than either form of Christianity, okay? And so, uh, you know, we'll, we'll clean up. The Christians will kill each other off. More power to them. And uh, especially, you know, uh, Constantius hates this guy, Athanasius. I say Athanasius should go back to Alexandria. That'll really mix it up, okay? And so, uh, uh, 361, uh, Athanasius goes back to Alexandria. And once again... He starts digging in uh, with both boots on and spurs, throwing himself into not only re-evangelizing, but rebuilding the church. <laughs> and one of the things that he does, he's such a, an effective and dynamic guy, especially schooled uh, by uh, the, you know, the suffering that he's gone through his entire life, that he's converting pagans. And they say, hey, you know what? All kinds of pagans are even going over to Christianity now. And, and Julian says, I, hey, no! No, I mean, that's a sacrilege. I don't want any of that, okay? Uh, I, Constantius may have been wrong about everything, but he was right about Athanasius. Athanasius has got to go, okay? And so he says, uh, arrest Athanasius. <laughs> you know, he's converting pagans. I, that's not allowed. We're back to paganism being the official religion of the Roman Empire again. So he's got to go. And so he sends people down to Athanasius. Athanasius has to take it on the lamb again, okay? Uh, and uh, he, but it's not very long, okay? Because after a rule of only about 18 months, the Persians attack uh, Julian, okay? And uh, Julian uh, doesn't make it in battle, okay? Uh, he uh, uh, dies on the Persian front, okay? Of illness uh, 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 contrived there. And now uh, the general underneath him fighting. Uh, 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 again, it's the Persians. It's a guy named Jovian. Jovian takes the emperor. And guess what? Jovian is a Catholic. And he says, okay, Athanasius, go home. <laughs> Everything is okay. You know, don't worry about it. And uh, now without the imperial authority, without blandishments and favoritism and persecution going the other way, propping up the Arians, uh, you know, they, they start actually first fighting among themselves. There's like about five different kinds of Arians, depending on the different degree that they have of how far away they are. Like they're, they're, they all, each of them have their own names. There's the, the Anomians, okay, the ones that say that Jesus is nothing like the Father, okay? There's the Homoeans, who say that Jesus is like the Father, the Son of God, the Son is like the Father. Then there's the Homoousians. One extra is very like the Father, okay? Uh, and so, uh, and, and Athanasius, interestingly enough, and actually Liberius too, decide on a policy of reconciliation. Again, here we go with that again. 
that they said, look, what we're going to do is, okay, th things were tough. A lot of people you know, did things that they didn't probably really didn't want to do. Uh, let's uh, let them come back if they're sorry, if they're willing to you know, accept the true creed. Uh, let them come back and we'll, uh, you know, we'll rebuild the church together. You know, let's buy God's bears. Let's begin and begin again. And uh, practically most of them come back. And the Aryans shrink into a very, very small minority group such that, you know, things, you know, they, they still have their supporters. I mean, there's a, a, a flare up a few years later under another emperor in the east named Valens, but it doesn't last long because by this time, the, again, with a dynamic and quite frankly, holy bishop like Athanasius in charge, um, you know, Valens said, you know what, I, if I start antagonizing Athanasius again, I'm just not going to win. You know, he's just too popular with the people. Uh, there's too many people that like him. I don't need this trouble. I'll just, I'll just let him do it, okay? <laughs> And so even though Valens favors the Arians, uh, Athanasius, uh, he lets Athanasius uh, stay, okay, uh, after a brief persecution. And uh, he finishes his life as uh, Patriarch of Alexandria. Uh, and interesting, after a number of years, year 381, uh, uh, there's a, lo a council in Constantinople. And they said, okay, now let's, let's get everything clarified. Let's get a clear statement of faith on the divinity of not only the Son, but the divinity of the Holy Spirit too. And let's get a creed going that, uh, you know, spells this out clear and straight. And it's the creed that we say at Mass every day, every Sunday. The nice, it's called the Nicene Creed. It's really the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, okay? It's the Creed of 381. That's the one that we say. It's said throughout the Christian world. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. Uh, Athanasius, Athanasius is so popular that when he dies, uh, they decide to make his younger brother. Hey, we want more Athanasius. Okay, we'll have his younger brother be, be uh, 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 patriarch after he dies. Uh, he was exiled. Athanasius is really an amazing and remarkable man. I could have told you more stories about him. He was seven times exiled from his diocese. He was hunted. Even the Pope was officially against him for a while. He had no rest, but he never gave up. He never surrendered. <laughs> okay, reminds of Winston Churchill. You know, we will never surrender. Okay, what, what, how was he able to do that? Okay, where did he get the strength? When even old codgers like Osius, a very good man, when Liberius caved in, what was it that made Athanasius able to live always to fight another day, to continually participate not only in the death of Christ, but in the resurrection? I think it was this. He never took his eyes off Jesus Christ. That's the lesson for, I think, for all of us. Jesus wasn't, uh, his religion was not a feather bed to him. It was always a dialogue with the God-man that he had seen. Okay, he, you know, St. John, in the beautiful first epistle to St. To St. John writes, I write about what we have, what I have seen. What we have seen what I held with my own hands, what I experienced. And I think that, you know, and Peter, you know, when Peter had his eyes on Jesus Christ, he was able to walk on water too, you know, for a, a, a short period of time. When he took his eyes off Christ, down he went. Uh, it was from Christ that he had seen lived in Anthony and then started to live himself that was where Athanasius got his power, his sustenance, his courage from his relationship with the God-man the God who is true God and true man, that Jesus Christ that he kept dialoguing with, that he kept close to, rubbed off on him. And Jesus not only shared his sacrament with him, he shared the fullness of his life with him. And that's what the Christian message is all about. No matter what happens, it's not just a bunch of politics. Eusebius thought it was a bunch of politics. Even Liberius got tempted to think it was a little bit of politics, a lot more politics than it was. 
But for, for Athanasius, it was this relationship of friendship and love that he kept, that he never forgot, that he saw, that he exemplified, who gave him that life and that courage, that true faith, okay, handed down that tradition, okay, that led him back to a personal friendship, relationship, imbibement of Jesus Christ. Abide in me and you will bear much fruit and the fruit will last. Athanasius' fruit lasted. Uh, he lived his life with Jesus. He suffered with him and he also rose with him. An explosion in Egypt of Christian life took place because of Athanasius. That explosion created the age of the fathers, of the, the great Western and great Eastern fathers. Uh, the life of St. Anthony, which Athanasius wrote, was picked up a number of years later by a worldly rhetorician, a guy, a guy who spoke for a living, a PR person named Aurelius Augustinus. Okay? It was one of the things that Augustine read, which changed Aurelius Augustinus, man about town, into St. Augustine, Bishop of Hippo, father of the, of, 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 the, of the church, okay? It all started with someone saying yes to God every time he could, someone saying, I will prefer no one to you. And if we keep that, we also will keep our balance in the church. We will be able to say no matter who comes and who goes, our salvation comes from Jesus Christ, we will stay with him, we will be loyal to him, we will hold fast, as St. Paul says, to what's been handed down, holding fast to what's been given so that we can preach the true Christ, not a makeshift Christ, not a fake Christ, not a Hercules on steroids Christ or a pared down effeminate Christ, but the real Christ to the world because that's the only Christ, the Christ on the cross, the Christ who can save. That's the Christ that's given to us in the incarnation, will be with the church to the end of time, but we have to suffer with him and we have to live with him, even in the midst of darkness. And Athanasius knew what the darkness was. We know what the darkness is a little bit till we see it sometimes, but we stay close to Christ and we'll get through and we'll participate in the resurrection. Next week, folks, next week, we'll, we'll talk about a plot to actually capture the papacy, which succeeded uh, with uh, a, a court prelate being appointed Pope his name was Vigilius. Hear about it next week. Thanks for coming. Yes. Oh, yeah. One thing. Here is a, uh, you, if you notice, we're filming this. So, you know, we're paying a, a, a filmmaker to, uh, to put these things on so that we can preserve this. We'll put it on the thing. Uh, he happens to be my son, but he also needs to, he's, he's got to pay, sure. his time is worth something. So if you could donate uh, a little bit, then we can actually pay Tommy <laughs> for the good work that he does. And uh, also uh, help the church, hopefully, if you're generous enough, too. Thanks. And by the way, this is uh, kind of how Congress works today, I think. Something like that. Similar. You said it. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> Anybody have any questions while we're passing the hat around here? Yes. Where were, you said that most of the, the bishops, the majority of them, were with Arians. How about the, the guys sitting in the pew? Did they follow Arians? Well, it, okay, there was a greater, much greater level of theological acumen among the laity than there is now. So, uh, uh, unlike now, where there is. Uh, with uh, 50 years of uh, uh, uneven catechesis, Catholics really don't know their faith very well. Okay, and you get a, they think that we think they do, they think they do, but there's a great deal of confusion out there, unfortunately. Okay, uh, at this time, not as much. Okay, people would very, very seriously take. Uh, the doctrines, okay? They didn't have just TV to entertain themselves and stuff. They, 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 they read these books, they look at them. And so uh, the, it was the situation, uh, the, the close, most closely analogous contemporary situation that I can, I think, point to is the situation in China with the underground church and the above ground church, okay? The, uh, uh, a lot of people, or maybe in Ukraine, other communist countries, 
even though the, the church may be dominated by forces that they don't like, a lot of people will go to that church because it's better than nothing, okay? It's something, okay? So they'll go to the patriotic Chinese church even though they'd much rather not, okay? They'd much rather go with the underground, although if you go with the underground, you may get end up in a you know, uh, you know, slave labor uh, camp in, in Sinkiang or something like that. So uh, same thing in Ukraine. There were a bunch of churches that were turned over to the Russian Orthodox Church, Catholic churches, Byzantine Catholic churches, and uh, uh, people continue to go to their old church, okay, continue to listen to their Orthodox appointed bishop, okay. But once the church became free in Ukraine, all kinds of those churches returned to Rome. <laughs> you know? And same thing like in China. If China were truly free, not being under the thumb of this crazy patriotic uh, association of uh, Chinese Catholics ruled by Beijing, okay, uh, uh, most of the Chinese Catholics, I believe, would probably choose to go in union with Rome. Because some of these bishops, even uh, that have now been reconciled, apparently, to the church, uh, you know, would really like to be with Rome. So, uh, you know, it's when freedom is allowed, you know, it's morbid. Uh, uh, there were some who were sincere and militantly Aryan, but they were a minority. Most of it was more of uh, actually, as Cardinal Newman did a wonderful study. Henry Cardinal Newman. Uh, he wrote this before he became a Catholic. It was called the Aryans of the fourth century. And he, uh, this was one of the things, uh, the, in his study of this, was one of the things that induced, that really put him on the fast train to uh, Termini Station in Rome. Okay. Because he, uh, uh, he started seeing that it was this sense of tradition and orthodoxy okay, that really held the church together, prevented it from becoming just a tool of the state. And you could see also, too, that it, in his opinion, it was ordinary people who still had the Orthodox Catholic sense that did not want to go along with ideas that sounded strange and foreign to them. There were some, now, on the other hand, uh, the, the barbarian tribes, the Visigoths uh, and uh, uh, the Ostrogoths uh, uh, were, uh, and the Vandals, they all went, ultimately, they all went Aryan. It's easier to understand. Uh, they didn't have to be uh, in union with people that they wanted to fight against. Okay, uh, uh, so if, you know, f for the next, from say the year 400 to uh, 700, uh, the Aryans were primarily barbarian tribesmen. Uh, of course, the only barbarians that ultimately weren't Aryans were our friends, the Franks, who were Catholics. Uh, thanks to Clovis and Clotilda, you know, who, uh, uh, you know, uh, Clotilda was a Catholic and she ultimately converted her husband. And then uh, the, the Franks were Catholic, but the, the Goths and the Vandals and also they were Aryans. And they were, they're, they're, the religion was not united with the rest of the church, so they could dominate their local church. And they could pretty much believe what they wanted to believe and do what they wanted to do. And uh, it was looser. So that was more their style. But uh, for uh, people in the Roman Empire, uh, the Aryans uh, appear to be a, always a minority in, in reality, although they controlled 90% at one point. Any other questions? You sure? Okay, see you next week. Thanks for coming.